you guys as Christians, you know, we can talk, we can say anything, we can say, oh, I'm not afraid to die. It's another thing when you're on that table and you're feeling the exact same thing as when you were sitting comfortably in the pew and you're going, nope, I know where I'm going. I know what Jesus has done because of the gospel. Oh, man. I hope you guys are just overwhelmed by him tonight. I am. I'm just blown away by who our God is. I was praying for you guys, and I'm like, God, what? What do you want your church to know? Because I want you to be blessed. I want you to live that type of life like Luke where, hey, anything can happen. And this isn't something I dread. It's actually, it's all good. And I know there's some of you sitting here and you're going, I don't think I'm there. I want to be there, but I'm not there. And I want that for you. I want that perfect peace. There's a verse that I've been meditating on this week. Um, it's in Isaiah 33. And I just found it not strange. I mean, a little bit strange. But then I'm just like, oh, this is so true where he says to Israel in Isaiah 33, at the end of verse 6, he says, the fear of the Lord is your treasure. The fear of the Lord is your treasure. The fear of the Lord is Zion's treasure. I want you to have this treasure. See, most of the time when we think of the fear of the Lord, people talk about it like it's a bad thing. Oh, I don't want to talk about the fear of the Lord. And yet scripture says the fear of the Lord is your treasure. Man, this is like your greatest possession. This is like a gift from God. If you have a fear of the Lord, that is a gift from God. That's an amazing gift from God. Just today at lunch, a buddy of mine was asking me if I'd spend, like, he has a son who's turning 18. He's like, man, did I prepare him well? He read some book, and he says, you know, ask, like, a couple guys that you respect to just impart something to your son. And so he, he, he said, you know, I was thinking about, did I prepare my son with finances and understanding how to use it for the Lord and everything else? No, I'm going to have him spend half a day with this one guy, you know, that he respects because he just uses everything for the Lord. And then he goes, you know, I, I want him to learn about prayer and fasting. And so I'm going to send him with this other friend of mine for half a day. And then he said to me, he goes, hey, could you spend half a day with him and teach him how to fear the Lord? I'll just say at lunch, he goes, when I think about the fear of the Lord, you talk about that a lot. And I see it in your life. And I just got so excited. I go, you know, I do talk about the fear of the Lord a lot because it's my treasure. I never got it until I saw that verse this week. Like, that's, I, I don't know, like, I'm so glad at the, at the core of who I am is I have, I understand what he is like and I have a healthy fear of him. And the Bible says that is your treasure. And he says, you know, you talk about it a lot. Why? Because we talk about the things we treasure. Some of you, you can't stop talking about your kid. Right? Because that's your treasure. Or your spouse. Or your job. Or one of your possessions. Or yourself. 
Because that's what you treasure. And I never realized, man, the fear of the Lord really is my treasure. I'm just thanking God. If you have a fear of God, thank him for that. Because not everyone fears the Lord. Many people treat him like he's nothing. And as though, you know, they've got power over him. They don't humble themselves before him. In Proverbs, uh, there's a couple of verses I want you to look at. Verse uh, 26 says, In the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence, and his children will have a refuge. Okay, in the fear of the Lord, one has strong... Don't you want strong confidence? Wouldn't you just love to walk around with a confidence? Where you're on a hospital bed and you're like, I don't, I'm not afraid of this. I don't dread this. I have this strong confidence. The Bible says that's because you've got a fear of the Lord. You understand who he is and that's central in your life. And what it says, it says, it, so, so, so men, he, he says, if you fear the Lord, he says, your children will have a refuge. Men, women, moms, dads. The fear of the Lord is a treasure. And if you are parents who, who fear the Lord, your children actually can find safety with you. It's not an awesome verse. Like, this is why it's important. Your kids will always know there's a place that, that mom and dad, they are rock solid, fearing the Lord, and that's their refuge. And then in verse 27, it says, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life that one may turn away from the snares of death. It's a fountain of life. Everyone's searching for, you know, remember they used to make those movies about people looking for that fountain of youth or the fountain of life? And the scripture says, here's the fountain of life, the fear of the Lord. You fear the Lord, and it's just this constant source of life. It's like a spring of water that just keeps on going. So the fear of the Lord is a big deal. It's an awesome thing. It's not something that, that is just for people in the past and, oh, we're under grace now. No, like the verse we were meditating on when you guys came in, it's like, no, with him there's forgiveness, therefore we fear him. The fear is for those who have been forgiven. Well, what I want to do this evening is not talk so much. Um... I want to continue in this time of worship and I want the word of God to minister to you. So tonight I want to look at Hebrews 12, but it's kind of half sermon, half meditation where you just stare at the word of God because the Bible says this is to him to whom I look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and who trembles at my word. It's the person who trembles at his word. So we don't want to just talk about it. We want to tremble at it. And right now in our Bible reading, we've been reading Hebrews. So I want to do some uh, verses from Hebrews 12, starting in verse 14. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Just meditate on that. Go back. Tremble at that command.
strive for this. Remember one of the verses we memorized this year is, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And here he's saying, strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. Let's see that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble. And by it, many are defiled. This happens in the church a lot. Someone gets bothered by something. They get embittered. And what do they do? They start talking. And this root of bitterness starts spreading and destroying and God is saying, make sure that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble. And maybe bitterness in your own heart has defiled other people. That no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. Now's the time to confess to the Lord pornography, lust, and God forbid if there are any relationships in here, sexual relationships with anyone who is not your spouse. Let's have a fear of the Lord on that. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. been sharing this passage several weeks now of uh, the deceitfulness of sin in Hebrews, how it says, if, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. Don't let your hearts become callous. Today is the day of salvation. Remember we talked about the calluses, you know, from, from playing guitar? It, it, it hurts so bad, but each time it's less and less to where you don't feel it. And so if you feel the conviction now, praise God that you still feel conviction over your sin. And confess that and turn from that. In verse 18, he starts describing God. Now, before we get into this, let me explain a little bit. A lot of people 
think, and we've talked about this, how the Old Testament is this terrifying God, and then the New Testament, it's all about grace. And when you read the book of Hebrews, you realize God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if anything, there's actually an increase of fear and intensity and, and more things are understood about grace. And so some people have taken this passage and said, well, that first part doesn't really apply to us, that that's talking about the Old Testament, which is true-ish. But it's, 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 not, it's not that that's not, that God is different now. It's just saying it's all of that and then some. Okay, so it's almost like, this isn't, it's not just merely what they experienced in the Old Testament. It's actually that, and then even more. That's what we're reading in our Bible reading today, right? When he says, look, if you don't even listen, if they, if they had to pay for not listening to the angels, you know, or from human beings, how much more when we have been warned from heaven by the Son of God? If he knew how to show retribution then, how much more so now, right? That was our Bible reading this morning. So it's the same thing here. He's saying, look, look at the Old Testament, and then, wow, we have even more now. So he starts off in Hebrews 12. He says, for you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest. Remember when we started tonight, I said, okay, let's lock eyes on God. Let's, let's sing to him. But what do you picture when you think of him and who you're singing to? The, the author of Hebrews is reminding us of the Old Testament. This was Moses going up on the mountaintop. They used some of these words. This is Job when, when it says God answered him out of the whirlwind. This is Moses when he, he saw the burning bush. So he says, for you have not come to what may be touched. Okay, so when you're speaking to God, don't think of him like, like, like a person like me, that you could just come up and touch me. He says, no, do you understand who you're approaching? You're not, you, you haven't come to what may be touched talking about a blazing fire, a blazing fire. Think of these words, darkness, gloom, tempest. Is that what you think when you think of God? Because these are words that the Bible uses to describe him. That as Moses was going up into this mountain, they're going... Man, this is crazy. I mean, it's a fire. And yet it's just like this deep, gloomy darkness. And the, the, the tempest was the idea of like a tornado. I mean, picture like standing as a tornado's coming towards you. And you're in total darkness, fire, gloom. That's our God. This is why I fear him. I just read this description. It's my natural response to go, okay, you are holy. I don't know anyone like you. We don't describe anyone like this but you. And the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. This is exactly what the people said. They said, Moses, you go up and talk to him, but we, I, they're going, we can't believe we're still alive to hear the voice of God and survive that. If you read Deuteronomy 5, Exodus 19, it describes this moment when they're just like, don't let him talk. To, we're, we're, we're terrified of this voice. You go. How do you picture the voice of God? What's it sound like? So we have to be so careful with some of these things that we can flippantly sing. 
you know, I want to hear your voice. Okay, yes, but let's, let's be careful about that too. Let's maintain our reverence. Go on. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be, in sto it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. This is our God. He is like no other. He is so different from anyone you've ever spoken to or even thought about. Then he goes on in verse 22. He says, but, and understand, is not saying that's the way he used to be and here's the way he is now. He's saying, understand, that was what was revealed to them in the Old Testament, and now he's revealed even more. He says, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering. He's explaining, we're not like those people in the Old Testament that just had to stand at the base of the mountain and couldn't really go up into the presence of God and Moses had to go up for them. And they couldn't hear the voice of God. I'm like, okay, you just go, you go listen to it because I feel like we're going to die. He says, we actually have a greater access now. And now we actually get to approach Mount Zion. Not just Mount Sinai and stand at the base of it, but now we're going to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering. Okay, when you, when you sing, when you pray, when you come in this room, are you picturing just us? Or do you ever picture yourself joining with innumerable angels in festal gathering. What does that look like? See, understand, when you, when you lock in on the throne of God in the heavenly Jerusalem, sitting on his throne, then also picture, like, just innumerable, more than you can count, angels celebrating Okay, so, so whether you show up or not, there are innumerable angels celebrating God on his throne. And so at 6.30, we're not starting worship. We're like joining in with innumerable angels. And, and, and as they're screaming, worthy is the lamb who was slain, you know, as, as, as Vince and Vince read and, and Joe read even better, it's just like, wow, it's just like, I'm, I'm screaming with them. Yes, worthy is a lamb. I mean, picture a throne with angels everywhere celebrating. Worthy is a lamb. Worthy is a lamb. And then here we are on the earth in this little room and we're screaming the same thing. Yeah, we agree with all those angels. I can't believe you, Jesus, what you did for me. This is the God we come before goes on and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven and to God the judge of all and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect so who else is up there my brother-in-law whose funeral I did last week I'm joining with him now. 
with Zuri. That's why Luke can can be sitting on an operating table with a huge growth in his in his body and go, I'm either going to celebrate up there or I'm going to celebrate here. But worthy is a lamb who was slain. And I'm going to come before that judge and the assembly of the firstborn. I'm going to, the assembly of the firstborn who were enrolled in heaven. There, there are people who made it there before us. And we're joining them. We're joining the angels. And we come before God, the judge of all. Man, what a great phrase. God, the judge of all. And to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. And to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. I sure hope when you came tonight, you were not thinking, oh, I'm going to go to a church service and I'm going to hear from a preacher. But in your heart, you're going, I'm going to join innumerable angels in festal gathering. I'm going to come before God, the judge of all, and I'm going to come before Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. Okay, it's the same thing we read this morning in Hebrews 2. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking, for if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. Okay, I, that's very clear. Like Moses gave a warning, and when they didn't, they didn't heed that warning, what happened? They were judged. So that's just Moses. We've heard from the Son of God. At that time, his voice shook the earth. But now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. So yeah, when they were standing at the base of the mountain, the whole mountain was shaking. That must have been terrified. Terrifying. I don't know how many of you have been in like a severe earthquake. Lisa and I were in that Northridge earthquake. It was crazy. And so imagine standing on, a, on the, at the base of a mountain and everything is shaking. And he says, well, once more I'm going to shake not just the earth, but the heavens. Okay, what does that even mean? He's just saying, it's going to get more intense. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken. That is, things that have been made in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. You see, this? He, he's not saying, so that's why they had so much reverence and fear in the Old Testament. And that was for back then. He says, no, it's even more intense now. 
Okay, you remember those stories of them carrying the Ark of the Covenant and Uzzah touches it and is struck it. All these crazy instances in the Old Testament with the power of God. And you're like, wow, they, they must have feared him, feared him, feared him. And, and we somehow, I, I don't know, in the 70s, 80s, we, we start shifting the narrative as though in the New Testament, we don't need this reverence anymore. And we can come to church casually. And we can kind of just, uh, you know, gather together casually and worship, gather, you know, casually. And, and we're trying to beg people to come and, and lure them in with free iPads or whatever else. And, and it's like, do you understand? This is, this is a holy God that we've come before. And he says, because we've received a kingdom that cannot be shaken. We're a part of this heavenly kingdom. This unshakable, this invisible, even the heavens, he says, will shake. Even the earth will shake. But we're a part of this invisible kingdom that cannot be shaken. His promises have been made to us. His, his spirit is in us. And so we're beyond all of this. It's going to be shaken. And he says, because we know that, then let's offer to God acceptable worship. What does that word tell you? If he's telling us to offer him acceptable worship, what does that tell you? There's unacceptable worship. This, we talked about that a few weeks ago. Malachi, you know, chapter 1, when they bring those, their leftovers to God, God's like, I'm not receiving that. All through the Old Testament, God made it clear, I'm not listening to your songs. He goes, that's, that's what you call a fast? You're not even caring for the poor. I'm not going to listen to you. This is from the start, from the beginning, the story of Cain and Abel, right? And we as human beings living in, you know, the 21st century, we're going, oh, that's not fair. How come he rejected Cain's? Look, there's an acceptable sacrifice and there's unacceptable sacrifice. And what God is saying to us is, hey, because of who this God is, let's offer him worship that's acceptable. And he defines that as with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. With reverence and awe. Not like, all right, let's worship again. But man, when you hear the gospel like Vince presented it earlier, does your heart just go, what kind of being are you? You are so amazing. I just want to praise you. When you read this passage from Hebrews and you think about this consuming fire and you think, I'm about to join all of these angels in heaven. How do you sing to him? With reverence and awe. My prayer for myself coming in tonight. Okay, coming into this evening, I prayed this today. I'm like, God, can you make me more reverent than I've ever been in my life tonight? That was my prayer. I encourage you to pray that right now. God, right now, as I'm about to worship you, make me more reverent than I've ever been.
Hãy subscribe